by God's grace, we finally made it to our final sermon in the sermon series on the doctrine of the Trinity. Initially, I started with the first part, part one of the biblical Trinity, and I preached an introduction or an overview on this doctrine. Two, I preached this full sermon about an hour and a half long on the Trinity in the Old Testament. Three and four, I preached two sermons on the Trinity in the New Testament. The biblical Trinity, part five, I preached a sermon on the Trinity in the gospel. Now today, I've titled my sermon, The Biblical Trinity, part six. And in this sermon, what I want to do is teach you all how to defend the doctrine of the Trinity. So in this sermon series, what I plan on doing is providing with you several biblical texts. I want to tell you what cults believe or what cultists believe and how they twist it. And then I'm going to teach you how to defend the doctrine of the Trinity. Recently, I just published a book and it's titled How Believers Should Respond to Protests Against the Trinity. So essentially, I'm just giving you an overview of what I wrote in this book. And this is a sermon I've preached on in the past, um, but today I plan on bringing a little bit more content. My responses to some of the cultists will just be overview of some of the arguments that they'll make, but ultimately what I just want to make sure that you guys are aware of is what are the common texts that the cultists will twist, and how do you defend the biblical doctrine of the Trinity? By God's grace, I hope I'm able to accomplish this, this today. Now, the reason why it's important that we understand this, because you got to remember something. The true gospel that we affirm is grounded in the biblical doctrine of the Trinity. So we have to proclaim this truth. That's why the gospel of Mark says, go ye into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But the Bible says you're not only to declare the truth, but the Bible says you also have to defend the truth. You cannot miss that part. 1 Peter 3 says, always being ready to give a defense or an answer to everyone that asks of you with meekness and in fear. Now, here's what I submit today to you all. If you can't defend the doctrine of the Trinity, then you cannot claim to know the gospel like you think. And if you can't defend the doctrine of the Trinity, then you don't know this doctrine as well as you may lead yourself to believe you do. So this is why I argue you have to be taught as many sermons as possible on the doctrine of the Trinity because the gospel is grounded in the doctrine of the Trinity. So if you can't defend it, then you don't know it like you think. And if you don't know it like you think, then you certainly cannot be a defender of it. Now, the reason why I argue this, because you have to remember something. My job as a responsibility as a minister is I have to preach the stuff to you. Because you know why today so many people don't know the Trinity that well or they can't explain the doctrine of Christ that well? It's because they've never been taught full sermons on the Trinity and Christology. So I take my job serious. Many people today say, well, we have to blame the church for this because no one's teaching uh, these sermons on these things. Well, that's why I take my job serious. I have a responsibility. I have to teach you this stuff. I have to teach you these truths. So it starts in the church. You have to be taught it in the church. Hold any minister accountable for this. Whether you're here or you're somewhere else, hold every minister accountable on are they teaching the doctrine of the Trinity faithfully and are they teaching the doctrine of Christ with passion? These are important. But also I submit to you all, it starts at home as well. It also starts at home. So this is why I tell everybody, you have to ground your family. And I'm talking to the heads of the home. Ground your family in this doctrine, because there's an old saying, if you don't ground your family in the gospel and in the doctrine of the Trinity, and you don't teach them what the gospel is, the devil will teach them what the gospel is not. And if you don't teach them how to stand against the false gospels and how to condemn them, the devil will teach them how to tolerate it. Regarding the Trinity, think about how many people have been duped into thinking they believe in the Trinity when they don't. Let me give you a real good example. Do you know how many people I've heard today say, oh, I learned the Trinity because I saw the movie called The Shack. Do you guys know how blasphemous that movie, The Shack, truly is? Do you know how they portray the Trinity in the movie called The Shack? They portray the Father 
as an obese black woman. They portray the son as a Middle Eastern beta male who dresses like a megachurch worship pastor. And they portray the Holy Spirit as a petite female. And some people think that's the doctrine of the Trinity. No, that is not the doctrine of the Trinity. That is called blasphemy. And I've, I've heard some men today say, well, I don't have a problem with my family wants to watch it. It's just entertainment. Entertainment? To see blasphemy? No, there's nothing entertaining about blasphemy. It's the same thing I hear about one of the most notable false teachers today, Joel Osteen. Do you guys all know Joel Osteen is a rank heretic? But you know what? Some people will say, well, I don't have a problem with Joel Osteen because he's just a motivational speaker. Motivational. So you think it's motivating to hear a guy take the Bible and twist God's word and that's motivating? In what manner? There is absolutely nothing motivating in, in any manner about a man that openly twists the Bible. So regarding the doctrine of the Trinity, I tell people, if you want to learn the doctrine of the Trinity, you take your family to the Bible, not to movies. You go to the Bible because the Bible tells you everything you need to know about the doctrine of the Trinity. A professor once told me in school one time, he said, uh, ministers, remember this. He says, the grass are green, but so are the poisonous weeds. You have to be able to discern between the two. And it's easy to get duped today. If you don't teach your family the importance of the Trinity, then trust me, someone else will teach them what it is not. Two ways that heretics today will deny the Trinity. And this is an easy two points to remember. Heretics will deny the Trinity because they will confound or conflate the persons or they will try to deny the essence. You have to be careful attention to these two. Because if you're not grounded in the doctrine of the Trinity, you're going to be easily duped. For example, uh, Mormons will say, we believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. Well, that doesn't mean, oh, well, after all, they claim to believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. Therefore, they're Christians. No. Mormons define the doctrine of the Trinity as three divine beings. That's polytheism. That is tritheism. That is heresy. That is not the biblical doctrine of the Trinity. I've even found some men, believe it or not, who claim to be sovereign grace believers. And this is the most saddest and shocking things. There are some men today who will call themselves sovereign grace believers, and they're some of the most notable heretics because they say they believe in the Trinity, but they believe the Father, Son, and the Spirit are ultimately referring to the same person. I've caught three guys that hold to that view, that call themselves sovereign grace Christians. So basically, they're holding to a form of modalism, essentially what is what they're embracing. Again, that's what happens if you don't become grounded in the doctrine of the Trinity and God has not opened your eyes to this truth. So that's why I've argued the grass is green and so are the poisonous weeds. You must be able to discern between the two. The biblical doctrine of the Trinity teaches that the one true God of the Bible exists in a trinity of distinct, co-equal, co-eternal, and co-glorious persons. If a man or woman does not believe that, then they are not Christians. They do not believe in the gospel. They need to be evangelized because God has not revealed this truth to them. So the reason why I argue we have to know these things is because you don't want to get duped by somebody and also, you want to make sure that you're able to defend this truth, because as I said earlier, if you can't defend the Trinity, then you don't know the doctrine like you think. So here's the rules of engagement for today. The rules of engagement today, I'm going to share with you all 15 Bible texts. That's one. Two, I'm going to share with you what do the cultists believe and how will they twist these texts. And then I'm going to teach you, number three, how to defend the Trinity and how to respond to these heretics that deny the multi-personality of God. So I'm repeat that one more time. I'm going to share 15 Bible texts with you all. I'm going to tell you what do the cultists believe and how will they twist these texts. And then I'm going to teach you how to respond and how to faithfully and biblically teach the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, as a disclaimer, there's several resources out there that you guys can learn how to defend the Trinity from. Many of these Groups I don't fully endorse, but there's some good resources out there. For example, 
You have the Department of Christian Defense, uh, the Christian Apologetics Resource Ministry. You have uh, Anthony Rogers has some good material online, Inspiring Philosophy, Trinity Apologetics. I don't endorse these groups, but regarding my sermon today on how to um, respond to common objections to the Trinity, these sources actually have some pretty good material regarding this topic, even though I don't agree with everything they state, and nor do I endorse them, not one of them. But I do believe they've got some good material because I am going to highlight some of their arguments um, in my sermon today. So if we can, let's immediately go to the very first point. Again, 15 biblical texts. Let's start with point number one. Point number one is going to be Numbers 23, 19. And what I would encourage you guys, if you'd like, when I tell you the text, you can open your Bible to go there or just listen because I'm going to cite it to you anyway. But Numbers 23, 19 says at the very beginning, it says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. That's the opening part of Numbers 23, 19. So that's the text. Cults will take this passage, and here's what they're going to say. They're going to say, Christians will say Jesus is God, but they also believe Jesus is fully man. But Numbers 23, 19 says God is not a man, therefore... They're going to say, Christ is not God. That is a common argument today that cultists will make to try to deny the doctrine of the Trinity, or they will try to argue that Christ is not God. Now, let's just uh, pause here for a moment, because I want to give you guys um, some ammo, or I want to provide you guys a biblical response or retort uh, to this um, argument that cultists will make. First of all, remember this about the person of Christ. We all know that Jesus Christ is fully God, but we also believe he's fully man. Now, we know Jesus Christ is fully God. We see it from the very beginning of, of Scripture. We see the triunity of God. Remember in my sermon on the Old Testament, I taught how in the Old Testament, how we see plural verbs, plural prepositions, uh, plural pronouns, we even see plural adjectives that highlight the glorious and blessed Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, who share the same divine nature. But when is it that Christ uh, assumed his human nature? You got to go to the New Testament. You go to John 1.14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. John 1.14 takes place long after Numbers. So do your math. Numbers is way over here. The Gospel of John chapter 1 is way over here. That's many, many, many years later. Okay? So it's a ridiculous argument for them to say, you know, well, Jesus is God and man according to Christians, but Numbers 23, 19 says God is not a man, therefore Jesus can't be God. That's the cultist argument. It's easy to refute. Now you also have to take a look at the context. What's the context of Numbers 23? You have to take a look at the distinction between the creature and the creator. The creator. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. So the creature will lie. Why? Because they have a sinful nature. Because they are born into this world totally depraved. Therefore, God has to grant them repentance. But Jesus Christ is... Fully God, but he's also fully man, but without sin. Okay, so when you take a look at Numbers 23, 19, the context is simply pointing out that the creature sins and needs to be granted the gift of repentance. But God is the creator. He's not like the creature. God is sinless. God doesn't need to repent. God doesn't lie. That's simply what the text states. It's an easy to respond argument. Um, against the cultists, okay? So that's just a quick overview over Numbers 23, 19. Let's go on to point number two. This is one I know I've shared with you guys several times, but I want to give a quick overview on it. It's Psalm 110. Psalm 110, verse 1. This is point number two. Psalm 110, verse 1 says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Now, regarding this passage, cults are going to say, or I would say even some Jewish scholars, 
They're going to say the Lord at the right hand. They're going to say that is the word Adon or Adoni, not Adonai. And they're going to say Adon or Adoni refers to a created being, not to Jesus Christ or not to the Messiah, so to speak. Now, here's what they're typically going to do. Jewish scholars are going to say the Lord at the right hand cannot be referring to Jesus Christ or it's not referring to God. They're going to say, if you go to Genesis 45, verse 9, they're going to say Genesis 45, verse 9 says, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made me Lord, Adon, over Egypt. So they're going to say, see, Genesis 45, 9, Adon is used, and it refers to a created being. Therefore, Psalm 110, the Lord at the right hand, Adon, is referring to a created being. Therefore, Jesus Christ is not fully God. That's what typically some people are going to say. But again, what they're doing is ignoring how Adon doesn't just have one meaning. The reference to Adon in the Hebrew is the word that I'm essentially uh, highlighting. And this is why I tell people, you want to definitely check out lexicons and commentaries because the Brown Driver Briggs lexicon, which is a big, thick Hebrew lexicon, will show you where in the Bible you can see where this word Adon is used and how it's applied. Do you guys know that Adon? Yes, in some places, depending on context, it does refer to a created being. But guess what else it refers to? It also refers to God. For example, not, uh, Psalm 97, <coughs> verse 5. Psalm 97, verse 5 says, um, The hills melted like wax before the Lord, before the presence of Adon, Lord. So you see, Adon is used in Psalm 97, 5, and that refers to God. So God again, is often used for this word Adon that is used in Psalm 110, verse 1. Okay, but moreover, here's where people fail to realize that context determines how a word is used. In Psalm 110, verse 1 of your Bible, it says, the Lord at the right hand is Adon. But remember, if you go to verse 5, if you take a look at the Lord is also at the right hand, do you guys know that the Hebrew word in verse 1 for the Lord at the right hand is a different Hebrew word for the Lord that is at the right hand in verse 5? Guess what the Lord is at the right hand in verse 5 is? That's the word Adonai. Okay, Adonai is, according to Thayer's lexicon, a proper name of God. So why is it you have verse 1, Adon is at the right hand, Lord is at the right hand. And then in verse 5, it's Adonai, Lord, at the right hand. That's because Adon and Adonai are used interchangeably. Okay? So again, the context of Psalm 110, verse 1, based on the context, and also given the fact that the New Testament highlights Psalm 110 many times, shows that it indicates Trinitarian plurality. It's basically teaching that Jehovah, the Father... And it's talking about the Son, the Lord at the right hand. The Lord, Father, the Lord, the Son. Again, two distinct persons who share the same divine nature. That's why they're both called Lord. So that covers uh, point number two. Now here's one that you guys may never have heard before. Proverbs 8.22. Proverbs 8.22, point number three. This text states, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way from his works of old. Proverbs 8, 22. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way uh, from his works of old. Now, here is uh, how the cultists will attack this passage. They're going to say, many Christians think that the context obviously refers to wisdom. They're going to say that wisdom is a personification of the Son. So they're going to say that since the text says the Lord possessed me, they're going to say the word possessed literally in Hebrew means to create. So they're going to say, look here, the Father has created the Son. So the Lord possessed me. Horrible argument. Horrible, horrible argument. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I was once led to believe that wisdom personifies the Son, but I don't think that's the context here. Now, let me tell you why people think wisdom personifies the Son uh, in Proverbs 8.22, it's because in the New Testament, many times, wisdom is mentioned with respect to Christ. For example, in 1 Corinthians 1.24, 1 
it says Jesus is the power of God and the wisdom of God. So many people think that Proverbs 8, the context of wisdom, is referring to Christ. That's what a lot of people think. I don't believe the context is referring to Christ, and I'll tell you why. Yes, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 24, does call Jesus the power of God and the wisdom of God. But nowhere in the New Testament do you see that the Father possessed him uh, in the beginning of his ways from his works of old. We don't see that language. Okay? Another reason why is the context. When you take a look at the word wisdom in Proverbs chapter 8, I think it's used about five times. So the context is dealing with an attribute of God. What God possesses is wisdom. And notice the context that it talks about his works of old, and I possessed you from the beginning. I believe it's dealing with wisdom that is eternal because God is eternal. Wisdom that never ceases because God never ceases. Wisdom that is perfect because God is perfect. What I'm basically saying is that the emphasis here of that you possessed me from the beginning of his way is dealing with simply an attribute of God, the wisdom that God possesses. And therefore, wisdom is a reflection of God's eternal and unchanging divine essence. Okay? God is infinitely wise. Okay? So I think that's what the context is referring to. And I think this is just a simple response to people that try to use this passage to deny uh, the doctrine of Christ. Let's now go on to the next point. And this is the text that I highlighted earlier. Isaiah 9.6. Isaiah 9.6. Believe it or not, you're going to be surprised how many churches today are going to be citing Isaiah 9.6 today. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. For the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That's the passage. Now, believe it or not, this passage right here is a common text that cultists today will twist and they will deny the doctrine of the Trinity with this passage. And I'll tell you exactly how. For example, here's what a cultist will do. And I'll, I'll talk to my brother Dave for a moment. This is exactly what a cultist will say to you. They're going to say, do you believe Isaiah 9, 6 refers to Christ? Of course you're going to say yes. They're going to say, is Christ ever called the Father? And you're going to say, no, the father and the son are two distinct persons. Well, they're going to say, well, you've been easily refuted, Mr. Dave, because in Isaiah 9, 6, he's called the everlasting father. See, the father and Christ refer to the same person. And that's how they're going to trap you. That is how they're going to try and trap you. But how do you respond? Very simply. First of all, they're making a major mistake because... Grammar is not on their side. Remember something I say this. I say this all the time. Grammar is never on the side of a heretic because they try to twist the Bible. But you have to remember something. This is a translation of what we have in the originals. The text that I'm citing, you have to go to the Hebrew. Do you guys know when you read your English translation? I'm not sure, depending on what translation you have. I'm reading the King James Version. It shows up as everlasting father. Everlasting would be appear to be an adjective, right? But in the Hebrew, it's not an adjective. It's a noun. Literally, if you go to the Hebrew text, it's, it's a, a noun, not an adjective. So if it's a noun, it's not going to be everlasting. The noun is actually going to be eternity. Okay, so this is a problem for the heretic. And I'll tell you why. The same noun that is used in this passage, Isaiah 9-6, is also used in Isaiah 57-15. It says... Literally in Isaiah 57, 15, it says, For thus says the high and the lofty one who inhabits eternity. So it's not the everlasting father. It is father of eternity is what it should, how it should read. Father of eternity. Some scholars even argue it refers to father of all the ages. Now that's important. Second, here's another thing that heretics fail to realize. Father has more than just one meaning, ladies and gentlemen. Now, most people today think if you say the word father, it refers to a parent of a child or a parent of a daughter or a son. That's not the only meaning for father in the Bible, okay? It's not. I can promise you right now. I looked at the Brown Driver Briggs lexicon, and it shows that 
Father is also translated as a founder, an originator. Father can also refer to uh, as a term of respect or benevolence or honor, literally. That's what the Bible can refer to the word father as. Let me give you one really good example. Genesis 4.21. You know what Jubal is called in Gen uh, Genesis 4.21? He's called the father of all who played the harp. Now, do you literally think he is the father of of every single person who has ever played the harp? Of course not. He is the originator. He is the founder. So when you would look at Isaiah 9, 6, when he's called the everlasting father, the proper translation is father of eternity. Now, why is Christ called the father of all eternity or the father of all ages? That's because he transcends eternity. That's because he existed before all of creation. Why do we think John 1 says all things are made by him. Why do we think uh, Colossians 1 says all things are made through him? Why do we think Hebrews 1 says, for by him uh, God had made the worlds and everything in it? Why do we think the Bible uses that language? It's because Christ is the ultimate agent of creation. He is in every way God, but distinct from the Father and the Holy Ghost. So again, Isaiah 9, 6 doesn't teach that the Father and the Son are referred to the same person. No. You have to go to the grammar, go to the exegesis, study the text, and you'll find that um, you'll see exactly how and why false teachers try to twist it. Again, because the grammar is not on their side. So they have to lie. They have to make up um, frivolous and, and futile um, testimonies to try to discredit um, what God's Word says. So now we want to move on to the New Testament. We want to go on to Matthew 24, 36. Matthew 24, 36. This is one I know I've shared with you guys before several times. Matthew 24, 36 says, But of the day of the hour, no man knoweth, not the angels or the Son, but the Father alone, or the Father only. Okay, some translations include the Son, some don't. If you look at the morphological Greek New Testament, it includes the Son. So I want to highlight this for a moment, okay? Now, that's what the text says in Matthew 24, 36. Anti-Trinitarians are going to go to Matthew 24, 36 and say, hold on a minute. God knows all things, but Jesus didn't know the day or the hour. Therefore, Jesus is not God. That's what false teachers will say. Now, let's talk about how to interpret that passage. Uh, Matthew 24, 36, but the, the day of the hour, no one knows. Now, here's what I tell people. That argument that the cults make that Jesus is not God because he didn't know the day or the hour uh, doesn't prove the point they're trying to make. It just proves they don't understand what the doctrine of the hypostatic union is. The doctrine of the hypostatic union teaches not that he's just fully man, but he's also fully God. But he's fully God and fully man in one person or the humanity and the divinity inseparably united in one person. That's the doctrine of the hypostatic union. So what does that mean? That means we're going to see texts where Jesus says things that only God could say because he's fully God, but we're also going to see passages where there's limitations, but without sin. And when I say limitations, for example... Doesn't the Bible tell us he doesn't know the day of the hour? He had to grow in wisdom and statute. He said, I thirst, he wept, etc. Those are the limitations, but without sin. But I tell people who deny the Trinity, you just don't understand the doctrine of the hypostatic union. You're just proving your ignorance. You don't understand because we believe in that passage where he says he doesn't know the day or the hour. But we can also show you other passages where he says he knows all things. That's not a contradiction. That's what you would expect to see with Christ who is fully God and fully man. Now, sadly, even some professing Christians misinterpret this passage. And many Christians misinterpret this passage because, again, as I've shared with you in previous sermons, they do not contrast verbs. You must, you must, you must contrast verbs or you will fall into heresy. Let me explain in a previous sermon, I know you remember how I highlighted the verb was in John 1.1. In the beginning was the word. 
And the word was with God. And the word was God. Now that verb was, according to the Rogers and Rogers lexicon, indicates continuous and timeless existence. And remember, it's in the imperfect tense. You have a verb that's in the imperfect tense that should tell you you need to pay careful attention to detail to what this text is trying to imply. Literally, the text is teaching in John 1.1 1, 1, that Jesus Christ is eternal. It's teaching that Jesus Christ is distinct person in the Godhead. And it's also teaching that he is in every way God, but distinct from the Father and the Holy Ghost. That's what the passage is teaching us. So you have to hold on to that verb, but then go to the verb in John 1.14. And the word became, you have to take a look at that word became. The word became flesh. Now, if you don't contrast these verbs, you will fall in a heresy, and let me tell you how. A lot of Christians today will go to that verb became, and they'll highlight the human limitations of Christ, but without sin. Well, Jesus didn't know the day or the hour. They'll go to that text, but then they'll ignore all the passages in the New Testament that says he knows all things, that teaches that he is omniscient. You can't do that. If you do that, you're doing what the Arians do. You're basically teaching that he is only fully man, but not fully God. Similarly, you also have to take a look at the text that deals with his divinity, that verb was, and you have to make sure you don't ignore the verb that deals with his humanity, because if you do that, you're not falling into docetism, which is the heresy that teaches that Christ is only fully God, but not fully man. You have to address both because he is fully God and fully man. Now, let me tell you how many today will fall into heresy because they do not contrast these verbs. Good example would be John MacArthur, a very popular minister today, very well loved, but he grossly fell into heresy in his interpretation of Matthew 24, 36. If you take a look at John MacArthur's commentary on Matthew 24, 36, it's nothing but double talk and heresy because he rightfully says, well, at no time during the incarnation did Christ divest himself of his power. Yes, that's true. But then he says that at no time during the incarnation did he know. What's the problem with that? He's highlighting the humanity but ignoring all of the texts that deal with his divinity. You have to contrast the verbs. You can't highlight one but ignore all the others. Okay? And then additionally, MacArthur argued that Christ had voluntarily restricted himself of certain attributes. And then he argued that the Father alone exercised unrestricted access to the divine attributes. You won't find that argument anywhere in the Bible. You will not find it anywhere in the Bible. In fact, Colossians 2.9 doesn't say, in him dwells only the restricted access to the divine attributes. It says in Colossians 2.9, in him dwells all of the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Literally, Paul was defending the full deity of the incarnate Christ. So again, MacArthur's argument just goes to show the dangers of highlighting the humanity but ignoring the divinity. Ladies and gentlemen, when my old pastor once told me this, when you go into the Gospel of John, remember when Jesus appeared to one of the apostles and said, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Did the apostles say, Lord, I know you know all things except the day or the hour. No. He said, Lord, you know all things. That's because he's fully God. So again, you want to highlight both. You want to highlight the divinity and the humanity. So I argue the person of Christ with respect to his divinity knows all things. But I argue the person of Christ with respect to his humanity didn't know the day or the hour. That's not a contradiction. Remember, he is fully God and fully man. And remember this also about the person of Christ. The person of Christ has two natures, but he also has two wills. Now let me explain that just very briefly, because I don't want to confuse anybody. In the nature of God, there is only one divine will, because there's only one divine nature. So people today that argue for two wills or three wills in the nature of God, that's heresy, because that's a tritheistic view of God because a will is a function of nature. Now, some people today will say, well, we believe in what's called a perceptive will and a revealed will. That doesn't mean two different wills. That's just two different aspects of the same will. 
That just simply means that God has revealed to us some things, and there are some things that God has not revealed to us. God has clearly revealed to us His Word, but God obviously has um, certain things in that the secret counsel of God that He has not revealed to us. That's not two different wills. That just means, again, there's some things He has revealed to us and some things that He has not. So in the nature of God, there's only one divine will because there's one divine nature, but regarding Christology, because a will is a function of nature when Christ assumed His human nature, He has therefore two natures and two wills. So you would expect to see examples where He says things, you know, that He knows all things, and you're going to expect to see passages that show limitations, but without sin. Now, here's another argument I heard from uh, a, a notable uh, theologian on the Trinity. His name is um, Anthony Rogers, and he argued that Matthew 24, 36, the word no, doesn't necessarily mean to be intellectually aware or simple knowledge. He argued it has a different meaning, and here's how we interpreted it. He highlighted several texts that make some good points. For example, Genesis 4. Doesn't Genesis 4 say um, Adam knew his wife Eve and she conceived and gave birth to a son? Well, clearly no there isn't just referring to being intellectually aware of something. It means intimacy. He knew his wife. Another example he highlighted was 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, where Paul said, For I decided to know Nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So clearly no there doesn't mean he was ignorant about himself or the world around him and didn't know nothing else. No, the point is he wanted to make nothing, he did not want to make anything known except Christ. So his point was simply to highlight that Matthew 24, 36 basically means that only the Father has the prerogative to make the day or the hour known. That's simply what the text is teaching. I tend to take the position that you want to look at that passage in light of the hypostatic union. Again, the fact that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. And as a book I read one time, which really highlighted this very well, it's called The Omnipresence of Christ. And it basically made the argument that the person of Christ, with respect to his divinity, knows all things. Okay? But the person of Christ, with respect to his humanity, didn't know the day or the hour. Again, that's not a contradiction. That's what you'd expect to see because Christ is fully God, and fully man. Let's move on to the next text, number six. Number six, I want to draw your attention to the Gospel of Mark chapter 10, uh, verse 18. Mark 10, verse 18, this is Jesus' interaction with the rich young ruler. And Jesus said, Why do you call me good? For none is good except one that is God. Okay, that's what the text says in Mark 10, 18. Now, cultists... We'll go to that passage, and here's what they're going to say. Jesus, Jesus just said that only the Father is good, and therefore he's not. Therefore, Jesus is not God. Now, first of all, you read that passage, okay? Read it to yourself and realize Jesus never said he was not good. He said, why do you call me good? That's a big difference, right? Jesus never said, I am not good. He said, why do you call me good? Okay, so again, don't allow the cultists to try to import something into the text that's not there. And yes, he did say, but there is only one that is good, that is God. Well, let's highlight the, the context real quickly. Look at the context real quick. You're dealing with Christ and the rich young ruler. Now, why did Jesus say to him, why do you call me good? For there is none good but one except God. That's because the rich young ruler was trusting in self-righteousness, not the Savior's righteousness. And think about that. Why? Jesus says, he had asked Jesus, what must I do to enter eternal life? And Jesus said, keep the commandments. And this rich young ruler deliriously thought he kept every single one of them since his youth. Now, the reason why we know the context, clearly Jesus was pointing him to his righteousness, because look at the context. He said, keep the commandments. Well, Jesus knew that this rich young ruler could not keep all the commandments because the, the law demands perfection. And men break those law, laws daily. So no one can perfectly keep the demands of the divine law since their birth. With one exception, Christ. Christ alone satisfied the demands of the divine law because the law reflects his divine nature. And he is a law unto himself. What's the second thing Christ said to him? Sell all that you have 
and he said, pick up your cross and follow me. What do you think pick up your cross and follow me signifies? Suffering and death. The rich young ruler's suffering and death could never appease the father's wrath. But Christ's substitutionary and propitiatory death exhausted the father's wrath on behalf of his elect. So ultimately, I agree with many scholars that have pointed out in Mark 10, 18, Jesus is basically telling the rich young ruler, you need to seriously consider the implications of thinking you can do these things. You're trusting in yourself and not the Savior. And Jesus was also pointing to him that the only acceptable law-keeping and the only acceptable death that one, whereby one can enter into eternal life is his perfect righteousness, not our personal righteousness. Because a man or a woman's personal righteousness, according to Scripture, is nothing but filthy rags, dung, and it is nothing more than a stench of death. But the perfect righteousness of Christ satisfied all that was necessary for God's elect to enter into eternal life. Okay, it's Christ's righteousness alone. So that's the point of why he said, why do you call me good? In other words, the rich and ruler had no clue who he was speaking to. Because if he did, he wouldn't have said to him, good master, what must I do to enter eternal life? Okay, so that's just the point of Mark 10, 18. Let's move on uh, to the next one. Point number um, seven that I want to highlight is, is going to be John 4, 24. John 4, 24. This text states, God is a spirit, and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay, John 4, 24. God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. False teachers are going to take this text and say, see, here is a text Christ is speaking to the woman at the well, and this text proves that Jesus Christ and the Spirit refer to the same person because it says God is a Spirit. Okay, horrible argument. First of all, when you read John 4, 24, notice how it doesn't say the Son is the Spirit. It doesn't say the God is the Spirit, and it doesn't say the Father is the Spirit. It doesn't say any of that. And, for, and secondly, the cultists are grossly in error when they think that the word spirit has only one meaning. They think the reference to spirit means it's referring to the Holy Ghost. And here's where they've gone grossly wrong. They fail to realize that the word spirit has several different meanings in the Bible. Yes, sometimes the spirit can refer to the Holy Spirit, but other times it can refer to an evil spirit. Okay, Context has to determine... What does spirit mean in context? Now, when you look at the Greek, literally it starts off with nevma o theos. Therefore, spirit does not have the definite article in the Greek text, meaning it doesn't say the spirit. Okay, there's no definite article there. But God has the definite article. It says the God. So how do you interpret this? I agree with a scholar by the name of Daniel Wallace in his book called Greek Grammar Beyond the Basics, he said that the reference to spirit simply stresses the nature of God. That's why it says God is a spirit. But in the Greek, there's no verb. It doesn't say is. There's no verb in the Greek. It says nevma o theos, spirit the God. The reason why the English says God is a spirit to simply show you that the Bible is highlighting that the word spirit stresses the nature of God. That's simply what it means. So the text does not teach that the Son and the Holy Ghost refer to the same person. It simply doesn't. Let's move on to the next one. Uh, point number eight, I want to take it to John 5.43. John 5.43 and point number eight. This text states, I have come in my Father's name and ye receive me not. That's just the first part. That's all I want to highlight. So because Jesus said, I have come in the name of the Father, or I have come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. Here's what cultists are going to say. They're going to say, well, Jesus says he came in the Father's name. Therefore, Jesus and the Father refer to the same person. Okay, that is what the cultists are going to say. They're going to say Jesus and the Father refer to the same person because Jesus said he came in this Father's name. Easy to refute these arguments. First of all, 
If you look at the context of the Gospel of John chapter 5, the Gospel of John chapter 5 shows us that the Father and the Son are distinct persons. So you can't say that the Father and the Son refer to the same person. Okay, Clearly, they're distinct persons if you look at the context of John chapter 5. For example, earlier in John chapter 5, because remember I'm highlighting John 5.43. Earlier in John chapter 5, remember when it said that that the some of the folks sought to kill Jesus because he says God was his father making himself equal with God. God was his father. That clearly shows that the son and the father are two distinct persons. Additionally, Jesus even told us in John 5 that the father judges no one but has committed all judgment to the son. So all should honor the son as they honor the father. Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. So we constantly see the distinction between Father and the Son throughout John 5, enough to show us that the Father and the Son are not referring to the same person. They are distinct persons. Now, here's the argument I want to present to you guys right now. So, cults will say, well, hold on a minute. In John 5, 43, Jesus says, I have come in my Father's name, so that must mean he and the Father are referring to the same person. Easy way to refute it. I was reading a book called A Definitive Look at Oneness Theology. The author is a Trinitarian, and he was refuting the same argument that I'm refuting right now from the, Trini from, the, from the Unitarians, and he highlighted a text that a lot of people miss. John 5.43, Jesus says he came in the name of the Father, but read 1 Samuel, I believe it's 1 Samuel 17.43. And believe it or not, David had spoke to the giant, and he told Goliath, he said, you have come to me with a sword, a spear, and a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Did you hear what I said? David said, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Now think about that. That doesn't mean that David and the Lord or God refer to the same person, does it? Just because he says, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts? No. This author was simply pointing out, in the name of simply means by the authority of or on behalf of. Similarly, in John 5.43 when Jesus says, I have come in my Father's name, it's, he's not saying that he and the Father refer to the same person. He's saying he's coming by the authority of. That's simply what the text means. Easy, easy text to highlight. Okay, And the heretics are not hard to refute. They're very easy to refute. Let's move on to the next argument. Let's go to John uh, chapter 10, verse 30. John 10, verse 30. This is one I'm sure you guys know very well. John 10.30 says, I and the Father are one. Now, Brother Joel, this is exactly what a cultist will say to you if they meet you. They're literally going to walk up to you and say, do you believe Jesus and the Father refer to the same person? And you're going to say, of course not. They're two distinct persons. They're going to say, well, the Bible speaks against what you have to say because John 10.30 says, I and the Father are one. See, the Father and the Son refer to the same person. That's what the cultists will say. But if you read it, it doesn't say, I and the Father refer to the same person. Now, does it? Of course not. It doesn't say that. So now let's, let me show you guys how you don't even need to really go to the grammar, the Greek grammar, to prove the heretics how their arguments are absolutely frivolous. Let me use an example real quick to you guys as an illustration. If I were to come over to your house... And I want you guys to be honest here, okay? If I were to come to your house and I were to say, my wife and I, or me and my wife, am glad to be here. Would that make any sense? My wife and I, or me and my wife, am glad to be here. That wouldn't make any sense because that's the wrong verb form, right? You don't say am, we would say are. My wife and I, or me and my wife, are glad to be here. Right? We have to use the proper verb form because you're referring to a plurality of persons. Therefore, you're going to have to use the proper verb form. Similarly, um, uh, imagine this. If, uh, let's say, the gentleman in the church, you're not going to say, Hey, uh, sweetheart, go get the door because Sonny and his wife am here. You're not going to say Sonny and his wife am here, are you? Why? Because you're, you're right. You're not going to say that because that's the wrong verb form. You're going to say Sonny and his wife are here. You got to use the proper verb. Look at the text, what it tells you. It doesn't say, I and the Father am one, does it? 
and says, I and the Father are one. Why do you think there's a plural verb there? There's a plural verb there because you have a plurality of persons. You have Father and the Son. If Jesus and the Father are referring to the same person, don't you think he would say, I and the Father am one? Another argument you have to consider is you need to take a look at the word one. One is not masculine in Greek. One is neuter in Greek. You know what that means? And I agree with um, a lexicon I was reading, the Rogers and Rogers lexicon. It refers to essential unity. If it's in the neuter, it's referring to the unity of essence. So this right here is a Trinitarian text. I and my father are, you have a plural verb and the neuter one. Two distinct persons who have absolute unity of essence. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a text that proves the biblical doctrine of the Trinity. It's a beautiful passage. Let's move on to the next one. This is one I know, I know for a fact you guys have heard before. Go to um, John 14, verse 9. We're on point number 10. John 14, 9. Now, there's an excerpt in there I want to highlight. It's kind of a long verse, but in John 14, 9, there's an excerpt in John 14, 9 that says, If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. You guys see that? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Cultists, false teachers or heretics, are going to go to that passage, and here is exactly what they're going to say. They're going to say, look at right here, it's proof. Jesus and the Father refer to the same person because Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. That's their argument. Easy argument to refute. Because again, they're going to John 14 and they're trying to use that passage to prove that the Father and the Son refer to the same person. Let me show you guys how easy it is to refute. Look at the context of John 14. The context alone disproves their position. In John 14, verse 1, doesn't Jesus say, believe in God, also believe in me, for in my Father's house are many mansions? Notice how Jesus is speaking and he mentions his Father. That clearly shows you that they're distinct persons. Go to John 14, 16. Jesus said, and I will pray to the Father, and he will send you a helper, and he will abide with you forever. Notice Jesus speaks in the first person about the Father in the, in the uh, third person. And he says, he will send you a helper. And then he refers to the Holy Spirit in the third person and says, and he will abide with you forever. That right there shows you that there are a trinity of persons in the Godhead. Even in John 14, 26. In John 14, 26, he says, the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. He will bring to remembrance all things that I've said unto you. So look at John 14, 26 by itself. John 14, 26, he says, The Holy Ghost, the Comforter, whom the Father will send in my name. You have three distinct persons. They're not the same. And notice what he said about the Holy Ghost. He will teach you all things. He's talking about the Spirit in the third person. Okay? That right there proves to us that the Father and the Son are, are distinct persons, and they're not the same. Now let's get to the text now. It says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Now remember this. In the Bible, it tells a similar language like this. Colossians 1 says, Christ is the image of the invisible God. Philippians tells us that he is in the form of God. Hebrews 1 says he is the brightness of his glory, the exact representation of his person. So clearly the Father and the Son are distinct persons, but they share the same divine nature. So I agree with guys like Gil when he said, look, if you have seen the Father, you have seen the Son, because they share the same divine nature. That's simply what the text teaches. So I've shown you guys the context alone disproves the, the oneness position, and it proves the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, since you're in John 14, let me take you on to the next one. Uh, point number 11, since you're in John 14, stay there, but go to verse 28. This is another text that the cultists will appeal to and twist. John 14, 28. <clears throat> At the very end, Jesus said, the Father is greater than I. John 14, 28. Jesus said, the Father is greater than I. Now in that passage, Cults are going to say, see, 
the Father is greater than the Son in essence. And they're going to say, therefore, Christ is not fully God. Well, read your Bible. Does it say the Father is greater than me in essence, nature, substance, or being? No, it doesn't. He just simply says the Father is greater than I. So now you're going to have to interpret what does that mean. Now, clearly, Jesus can't be saying the Father is greater than him in nature because they share the same divine nature. Okay, so that's important that you remember that. So another argument that the cults are going to say or that the cultists will say is they'll say, well, hold on a minute. The text in John 14, 28 says, Jesus said that the Father is greater than I. Similarly, Hebrews 1 says that Jesus is greater than the angels. Now, clearly, if Jesus is greater than the angels because his nature is better than theirs, clearly, Jesus is saying the same thing in John 14, 28. Horrible argument. And I'll tell you what. Because the word for greater in Greek that's used in John 14, 28 is the word mizon. That's not the same Greek word that's used in Hebrews 1 for better, better than the angels. It's not the same Greek word, not even close. So when you're reading that passage, look at the context. When is it taking place? During the incarnation. So it is an incarnational text. Therefore, Christ is saying that the Father is greater than him with respect to the economy of redemption, not to the nature of God in eternity. And when I say to the economy of redemption, the, the Son didn't send the Father into the world. It was the Father that sent the Son into the world. So that's what it's referring to. It's not referring to a hierarchy. It's not referring to anything with greater in essence, because that would be heresy. It's simply referring to the Father being greater than him with respect to the economy of redemption. Again, because it was the Father that sent the Son. It was the Son that came into the world. The Son did not send the Father easy text to translate. Now here's one that I definitely want you guys to pay careful attention to detail to. Go to John 17, 3. Please go to John 17 uh, verse 3. This is a text that you'll find that some people will try to take you to task on. John 17, 3 Jesus said, and this is eternal life that they may know thee the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is a text that false teachers will twist. And I'll tell you exactly how they're going to do it. A false teacher is going to say, okay, let's say for a moment I was a boxer and I said, uh, you are the only true champ. Therefore, I can't be the champ because I just said you're the only true champ. Therefore, Jesus says the Father is the only true. Therefore, he can't be God because the Father is the only true. That's their argument. That's how they're going to interpret John 17, 3. And it's an easy text to to interpret and it's an and it's a, it's 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 extremely easy to refute the false teachers on this one now remember this false teachers believe the father son and the spirit refer to the same person they believe the father and the son refer to the same person and they do not believe jesus christ is fully god that's what the false teachers will teach let me share with you guys just how the context of john 17 the first five verses refute both of those heresies. <laughs> Since you're at John 17, look at the context with me, please, at verse 1. At verse 1, Jesus said, Father, glorify thy Son, that thy Son may glorify thee. Now, Father, in verse 1, is in the vocative case. That's the case of address. That literally means the Son is addressing the Father, which means that clearly that shows that they are distinct persons. That's a problem today for people who believe the Father and the Son refer to the same person. Moreover, Jesus says, Father, glorify thy Son, that thy Son may glorify thee. Jesus is referring to the Father in the second person. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. So Jesus uses the vocative case, speaks about the Father in the second person, but he also talks about glory that they share. Now, why do you think they have sh shared glory? They have shared glory because they share the same divine nature. Therefore, they're co-glorious. Ladies and gentlemen, only God can receive glory and praise and worship. And that's just it. That's why they're co-glorious, because they share the same divine nature. Look at verse 2. Jesus talked about in verse 2 how he has the authority to give eternal life. Ladies and gentlemen, only God can give eternal life. Now, here is the text that I believe is 
a major blow to the cults and to all the cultists out there who deny the, the distinct persons in the Godhead. This is a major blow to them. John 17, 5. Jesus says, Father, glorify me with yourself with the glory I had with you before the world began. Father, in this passage, again, is in the vocative case. It's the case of address. Christ, the second time in John 17, addresses the Father. If he's addressing the Father, then that means they're distinct persons. So to say that the Father and the Son refer to the same person is easy to refute. Now watch this. He speaks in the Father in the vocative case. Now count how many times Jesus speaks in the first person about the Father in the second person. He says, Father, glorify me with yourself, with the glory I had with you before the world began. Jesus not only spoke in the vocative case, the case of address, showing that he's addressing the Father, but twice he spoke in the first person, and twice he referred to the Father in the second person. And then to add even uh, more ammo to the argument, Jesus talked about the glory he had with the Father before the world began. And ladies and gentlemen, God shares his glory with no one. But that's just it. The Father and the Son share the same divine nature, so therefore they're co-glorious. So this passage is a major problem for the heretics. Now, John 17, 3, and let's address John 17, 3. And this is eternal life that they may know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Now, many of the cults out there, they claim to be Christians. So they're going to say that only the Father is God, but not Christ. Or they're going to say that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit refer to the same person. That's what false teachers are going to say. But here, I've already demonstrated that the Father and the Son are distinct persons. I've already demonstrated that exegetically, linguistically, and theologically. <clears throat> now, in John 17, 3, here's what you want to ask the heretic. Say, who can give eternal life? And you know what they're going to say? God can only give eternal life. And I'm going to say, thank you for admitting that. Because notice in John 17, 3, having eternal life is knowing not just the Father, but also the Son. You guys see that in John 17, 3? And this is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So this is a passage that shows that Jesus is fully God. People technically get stuck on the word only true. And they say only true means only the Father can be God. No, because only true, I agree with many Trinitarian scholars who have argued that only true is not predicated on one person to the exclusion of the others. Only true when it is used in the Bible, uh, I agree with guys like Matthew Poole, who argue that it's in the opposition to the false gods and the heathens. So you're going to see many passages in the Bible where Jesus is called God, the Father is called God, and the Holy Spirit is called God, now, if the Bible says Jesus is God, that doesn't mean the Father and the Holy Ghost are not. No. If you see a passage that says the Holy Spirit is God, that doesn't mean the Son and the Father are not. No, it doesn't mean to the exclusion of. It just simply means only true is in opposition to the false gods and the heathens. So, for example, only true. Yes, this text does say only true, but Jesus Christ in 1 John 5.20 is called the true God. Okay? So we can expect to see this. Because why? The Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. Because they share the same divine nature. So this is exactly what you would expect to see. If you believe that the one true God of the Bible exists in a trinity of distinct, co-equal, co-eternal and co-glorious persons. Let's move on to the next text. We're almost done. We've got about three more. Go to 1 Corinthians 8.6. 1 Corinthians 8.6. This text says, But for us there is but one God the Father, of whom are all things, and we through him, and one Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and let's pause here for a moment. False teachers are going to say, because the Father is called God, and Christ is called Lord, then that means only the Father is God, but Christ is not. That's, a, again, a super weak argument, I know. It's a weak argument, but that's all the cults have today. Is they're so desperate, because the Bible, I mean, explicitly from the beginning to the end, teaches us that there is a trinity of distinct persons in the Godhead. 
But cults are desperate to make as many arguments as they can. So again, 1 Corinthians 8, 6 says, But for us there is but one God the Father of all things and one Lord Jesus Christ. So again, their argument is because the Father is called God and Christ is called Lord, therefore the Father is God but the Son is not. Easy argument to refute. Because if their argument is because the Father is not called Lord, therefore he's only God but not the Son. That's easy argument to refute because the Father is also called Lord in Scripture. For example, remember Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty five, 25? Jesus prayed and said, I thank thee, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and delivered them only to babes. Notice how he called the Father Lord. Now here's what's unique about Matthew eleven twenty five. 25. Another major problem for cults. Because Jesus said, I, he spoke in the first person, Thank thee, Father. Father, again, is in the vocative case, which means he's addressing the Father, that you have hidden these things from the wise of the prudent. He's addressing the Father and the second person, and again, he calls him Lord. So thus far, I've shown you guys how 1 Corinthians 8, 6, the Father is called God. Matthew eleven twenty five, 25, he's called Lord. So the Father is called God and Lord. Well, guess what? I can show you passages in the Bible where Christ is called God and Lord in the same text also. For example, uh, John 20, verse 28. It was uh, one of the disciples after he's seen the resurrected and exalted Christ. Guess what he said? My Lord, my God. So just because a passage says that the Father is God and it calls Christ Lord, therefore they think that means Christ is not God but only the Father is, that's a ridiculous argument. I could show you passages again where the Father is called Lord and God, and I could show you passages where Jesus is called Lord and God, or Jesus says things that only God could say. So again, these are just some of the weak arguments that the oneness heretics will posit, and they're not hard to refute. Um, second to last verse, uh, Colossians 2.9. Colossians 2.9, we're at point number 14. Colossians 2.9. This text says, In him dwelleth all of the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Okay, now if you're a Christian, you believe that this text teaches us that Christ exercised and possessed all the fullness or the plentitude of the deity because he is in every way God and has never ceased to be God. Okay, that's what true Christians believe. But now here's what the cults are going to say. Hold on a minute. Because the text says, in Christ dwells the fullness of God. They're going to say, you think that passage teaches that Jesus is God? Okay, they're going to immediately go to Ephesians 3.19. Because Ephesians 3.19 says that the Christians are filled with the fullness of God. So they're going to say, look, you can't say that Colossians 2.9 proves that Jesus is God because it says it, he possesses the fullness of God. In the same manner, you can't say Christians are God because they have the fullness of God in Ephesians 3.19. That's what they're going to argue. They're always going to take Colossians 2.9 and some of them are going to go directly to Ephesians 3.19. Let me share with you guys how to refute that argument. Again, it's not hard to do. What you want to do is uh, take them to show them how the grammar is much different and obviously the context is different, okay? When you look at Colossians 2.9, look at that word dwells. When you study that word grammatically, that's an important word because uh, one scholar I know argued that it means to permanently dwell and I know the Rogers and Rogers lexicon refers to the continuous state that points to the present reality. But the word Godhead, that's such a unique word there. The Godhead that's used in Colossians 2.9 is the word theotitos in Greek, which literally, according to the BDAG lexicon, means the divine essence. That word theotitos or Godhead that's used in Colossians 2.9 is not used in Ephesians 3.19. Again, so their argument falls uh, flat to the floor and it's trampled all over because that same Greek word is not used in Ephesians 3.19. So then it goes back to the, the second point is, well, what does Ephesians 3.19 mean when it says that Christians are filled with the fullness of God? Well, it simply means what exactly what it says. It doesn't say that Christians are filled with the divine essence of God. It doesn't say that. It just said they are filled with the fullness of God. In other words, you are filled with joy because God decreed your salvation. You are filled with peace because of what uh, Christ accomplished in your stead. 
You are filled with um, assurance because of Christ's uh, perfect righteousness that was credited to your account because of what he accomplished, not something you did. I would challenge you guys to read a commentary by Gill on Ephesians 3.19 on the emphasis on filled with the fullness of God means in Ephesians 3.19. Lastly, the last text I want to highlight, and this is an easy one I know you guys have probably have seen before, is Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. We'll go to the apocalyptic literature. But in Revelation chapter 3.14, it says... And to the churches, and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write, Thus saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now notice their emphasis of beginning. Now here is what the cultist will say. The cultist or the false teacher will say, Well, look, look at right here. Jesus is called beginning. So that means he is a created being or once had a beginning because he's called the beginning of the creation of God. That's what the cultists will argue. Easy argument to refute. Now, you're going to have to study that word that's used there. Are, um, it's actually in Greek. It's the word arhi, beginning. If you guys uh, study Dr. Robert Morey, he wrote a book on the Trinity, and it's a pretty thick book. But this guy did exhaustive research on that word arhi that's used. And basically, its usage in the Bible denotes or signifies primacy. Here's another helpful uh, resource you want to get. It's kind of expensive resource, but um, Dr. G.K. Beale, he actually is a, a renowned scholar, and he actually wrote a commentary, really thick commentary in Revelation. It's expensive. I recommend he's got a shorter version, but he's got the larger version. But the larger version you want to invest some money into because it's, it's that good. It is a solid read. But he argued that the word arhi that's used in Revelation 3.14 it doesn't signify the absolute sovereignty of God over the initial creation, but it's pointing to the resurrection as demonstrating his inauguration of the new creation or his supremacy or sovereignty over the new creation. And I agree with that. And the reason why is because if you look at the same Greek word that's used in Revelation 3.14 for beginning, it's also the same word that's also used at the very beginning of Revelation 1, when Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, uh, the beginning and the end, the one who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. So the beginning is just simply referring to primacy, sovereignty, uh, the fact that he has always existed and will never cease. You know, it's just simply highlighting the fact that he is God, but distinct from the Father. Thus far, I've provided uh, several biblical texts for you guys. I believe it was 15 texts. I covered uh, Numbers 23, 19, Psalm 110, verse 1, Proverbs 8, 22, um, Isaiah 9, 6, Matthew 24, 36, Mark 10, 18, John 4, 24, John 5, 43, um, John 10, 30, John 14, 9, John 14, 28, uh, John 17, 3, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, uh, Colossians 2, 9, and then lastly, Revelation 3.14. There's a lot of text to handle. The good thing is it's on uh, video. You guys can always go back and uh, touch on the arguments. I just published a book on this. It's lengthy. It's about 90-something pages. I'll make sure I provide it to you guys here as soon as they arrive in the mail so you can go back on there and take copious notes or study some of the arguments that I present. And um, this uh, concludes our sermon series on the Trinity. This is our sixth and final uh, sermon on the Trinity for a while. Um, by God's grace and Lord willing, I'm going to start a new sermon series next week on some gospel essentials. So hope you guys will join me. It was an honor uh, to preach God's word to you today. Let's pray, and then we will uh, conclude by going to the hymn. Lord Almighty, we pray that you will equip us to rightfully divide the word, but also to defend the truth Lord, I pray that you will equip us as watchmen. Lord, in the Old Testament, we see how the watchmen were entrusted to tell the truth and to protect those that they were entrusted over. And Lord, we saw the dangers of what took place when they neglected that responsibility. Bloodshed was the result. And therefore, the Bible warns us about the blood being on our hands. I pray, Lord, that we will be faithful watchmen. We will guard our, our homes. We will guard this church. 
against any error, any falsehoods, any heresy. Lord, forgive us for any error we have spoken. Forgive us, Lord, because we are fallible people. We are sinful people. But we put our rest and hope and trust in a perfect gospel, in the only gospel. And we keep our hope and faith and trust only in the righteousness of Christ alone because he is our only hope. He is our assurance. And he is uh, the very purpose that we preach this message today. Lord, again, we pray that you will equip us to defend the truth about the triunity of God and to be faithful and to not compromise in this glorious doctrine. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.